Um, it's really exciting to have you all here today. Um, so my name is Teresa Mares, and I'm an anthropology professor here at UVM, and I'm affiliated with the graduate program in food systems, as well as sort of the spire of excellence that we have here. Um, and I'd really like to welcome and thank you here today. This is our first in a series of speakers um, that is coordinated by the Masters in Food Systems. Um, and we just entered our second year in the graduate program, so that's really exciting. We've got some great students that have joined us this year. Um, so sponsors for today's talk include the graduate program, also the Transdisciplinary Research Initiative in Food Systems, and the Departments of Geography and Sociology. Um, and I'd really like to thank um, Alison Nyhart and Serena Parnow for helping with all the logistics and publicizing. Clearly they did a really good job. Whilst lots of people are getting extra credit today, one of the two. Um, so when I first heard that we were planning this speaker series, um, the first person that I popped into, that sort of popped into my head was to bring um, a colleague of mine, Alison Alcon, here. Um, I first met her, about, met her about five years ago at a conference on race and food, and since that time, I've been just continually impressed by the work that she's done, the kinds of publications that she's been responsible for, and um, sort of her contributions to the burgeoning food justice literature. Uh, she received her PhD in sociology from the University of California at Davis in 2008. Eight. Wow. wow. Um, and has been an assistant professor of sociology and is now the chair of the sociology department at the University of the Pacific in Stockton, California. And in just these few short years that she's been there, um, she's published and collaborated on nearly 20 academic articles, book chapters, and community publications, and was the co-editor for the volume Cultivating Food Justice, Race, Class, and Sustainability that came out from MIT Press in 2011. And her second book, Black, White, and Green, Race, Farmers Markets, and the Green Economy, was published last year by the University of Georgia Press. And this is all pre-tenure, which is very impressive. So Professor Alcon's work centers on the concept of food justice, and she has been instrumental in connecting this concept and this movement with scholarship on environmental justice, the green economy, and inequalities of race, class, and gender. She's going to um, give us an overview of some of her work. We'll have plenty of time for questions and answers. And um, we also will have a book signing following if you'd like to um, pick up one of, her, one of her two books now. Um, so please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Alcon. Can you guys hear me? Okay. All right, thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to get to come out here, um, learn about all the, all the work on food systems that you guys are doing here, the new master's programs, it's really, really exciting. Um, so thanks to Teresa for helping uh, bring all this together, making this happen. Uh, Serena, Allison, and everyone who offered extra credit. Uh, so my name is Allison Alcon, um, and I'm out here visiting from California, where I did my research, my dissertation research, and kind of ongoing research into the relationship between race and food. Um, my research seeks to understand how issues of race and class affect efforts to create environmentally and socially sustainable agriculture systems. Um, I'm, it comes out of a really deeply held belief that <laughs> sustainable food systems can change our relationship to the natural world, to the places we live, and to each other. But I'm also a real believer in the idea that racial and economic inequalities are not only unfair, but, but prevent us from building the kind of society where this is possible. So what I'm really interested in through my research is in understanding how actors on the ground create projects that are simultaneously designed to address environmental sustainability and also social, racial, and economic justice. So my research to date has worked to develop the concept of food justice. Uh, today I'll lay out the field as I see it, and within that context, discuss my own work on farmers markets. Towards the end, I'll describe some exciting new directions that I think the field is moving, and how I think my own future research can contribute, because I'm kind of in an in-between space where one project is more or less done and the new one is just getting started. Okay, so an overview of the concept. How many of you have heard of the concept of food justice? Okay. Some of you. All right, good. So the concept of food justice comes out of activist um, goals, but much like the environmental justice literature, what I'm seeking to do as a scholar and what I get to work with all these amazing scholars like Teresa to do is to develop an academic literature that is 
that is about what the activists are doing, that makes sense of the context in which they work, and that can really uh, critically engage with activist work in a way that can make it stronger and drive it further. So food justice as an academic literature is unified around two fundamental questions. The first is how are inequalities in race, class, gender, national status, etc., how do they manifest in the production, distribution, and consumption of food? So how do inequalities affect food systems? The second is how are communities, policy interventions, and social movements shaped by these inequalities, and how do they respond to them? So kind of what are the on the ground effects of these inequalities, and then what are communities and policymakers and planners all doing to push back against it? So these questions have resulted in a new but growing body of work examining both the conventional corporate dominated food systems and sustainable alternatives in terms of both their environmental and social consequences. So this is the totally non-exhaustive <laughs> theoretical section. So I trace the idea of food justice as an intellectual project to four interdisciplinary sources. Environmental justice, critical accounts of the sustainable agriculture movement, critical race movement, and food studies. So the environmental justice literature, or EJ literature, how many of you have heard of this one? So the environmental justice literature focuses most clearly on how low-income communities and communities of color have been disproportionately overexposed to the toxic consequences of environmental degradation. Right? The basic thinking is that the people who have the least power and privilege in our society are the ones who get hit kind of first and worst by environmental toxins. They live in the most toxic neighborhoods, they have the most toxic jobs, things like that. So first and foremost, food justice offers this field an opportunity to think about the production, distribution, and consumption of food as an environmental justice issue. Food is also an important lens through which EJ scholars are beginning to think about the distribution of envir environmental benefits, what Park and Pello call environmental privilege. So many studies have found that easy access to fresh food is positively correlated with income and negatively correlated with the percentage of African Americans living in a neighborhood. Additionally, alternative food systems also offer EJ scholars an avenue to explore the intersection of EJ and sustainability, what Julian Adjuman, my co-editor of Cultivating Food Justice, calls just sustainability. The con this concept leads food justice researchers to examine how activists can create projects that are simultaneously trying to do environmental work, trying to kind of improve the environment, while also thinking about racial and economic inequalities. And this is the aspect of my farmer's market research that I'll go into in just a minute. But first, more theory. So, secondly, Food justice scholars borrow two really key terms from critical race theorists. How many of you are at all familiar with critical race theory? Fewer, but a few. All right. So the first is intersectionality. Intersectionality is the idea that oppressions and privileges, things like race, class, gender, ability, sexuality, right, all the different kind of ways that we can think about hierarchies in our society, they're experienced simultaneously and they can't be separated. The second one is Omi and Winat's notion of racial projects. These are political and economic undertakings through which racial hierarchies are established and racialized subjectivities are created. So in simpler language, what that means is the notion that race, racism, sexism, classism, all these things are not just individual, it's not just somebody said something or didn't like somebody on the basis of race or gender or whatever. It means that these things are institutional and that the ways that states make laws, often in the interest of promoting capitalist growth, um, have the ability to differentiate groups based on race and to reward power and privilege unequally. So critical race theory also provides a basis for understanding how unexamined race and class privilege have shaped the sustainable agriculture movement. 
So many of you might be familiar with critiques that the alternative food or sustainable agriculture movement is elitist, right? Every so often somebody says, oh, this is just for you know, rich people who want to eat fancy food. So both ethnographic investigations and surveys reveal that sustainable agriculture projects tend to be disproportionately white. They tend to attract white audiences even when they're located in racially mixed communities. And scholars like Julie Guthman and Melanie Dupuy have shown that many of the narratives and histories that supporters and supporters of sustainable agriculture use to frame their goals are kind of implicitly reflecting white histories and white privilege. So for example, when Michael Holland tells us that we shouldn't eat anything our great grandmother didn't, wouldn't have recognized as food, right? He's not thinking about the fact that our great grandmothers had a variety of different food experiences. Some of our great grandmothers got to choose what they ate, right? Others may have been enslaved and been very limited in their food choices and the foods they would have recognized, right? Others were you know, if we think about Native American communities, others were literally taken away from the only foods they would have recognized, sent to boarding schools, and forced to eat different kinds of food, right? And so when Michael Pollan tells us not to eat anything our great-grandmothers wouldn't have recognized as food, he's not trying to tell us to think, you know, he's not thinking about slavery, he's not thinking about forced removal, right? He's trying to tell us not to eat things with pesticides and preservatives, and like, it's not that we don't get what he's saying, right? It's that, he, he's coming from such a privileged position that he doesn't understand that there's other narratives that other groups of people might read into what he's trying to say. So this is what I mean by the kind of intersection of critical race theory and sustainable agriculture. So lastly, the field of food studies has devoted significant attention to the relationship between food and cultural identity. So as individuals in particular, if individuals participate in culturally defined proper ways of eating, we perform membership in particular groups and mark others as outsiders. Food studies offers us the insight that food and culture are deeply entwined, but depicts that relationship as fluid and developing in accordance with particular cultural moments. So food is always cultural, but what cultures think of which foods is constantly shifting. Uh, it offers the food justice literature a sense of fine-grained attention to how cultural shifts occur. Okay. So to bring all this theory together, studies of food need justice and studies of justice need food. These literatures have a lot to gain from engaging with each other. And it's only in this newly emergent body of work on food justice that the racialized political economy of production and distribution meets the cultural politics of food consumption and its influence on individual and cultural identities. So let's get the dense stuff out of the way. Let's get to the data. So as an ethnographer, I tend towards really inductive approaches to research. I tend to kind of find a site I think is interesting and figure out what's going on and build my theoretical framework based on what I see on the ground. So in some ways, this talk is kind of backwards because I'm giving you the theory first and now I'm giving you the case. But I think it's important to tell you that the theory actually comes out of what I saw in these farmers markets. And so I wanna talk a little bit about what my findings were and what they have to say about the relationship between sustainability and social justice and the idea of food justice in general. So my research looked at a few different questions. It looked at how environmental sustainability and social justice are enacted differently in these differently situated farmers markets and I should, I should back up and mention that my research, I'll talk a little more about methods in a second, but I looked at one farmer's market in a predominantly white, wealthy neighborhood with a really long history of environmental um, activism, a strong, organic, gourmet food scene. And then the other one was in a low-income, predominantly African-American neighborhood, that was, and it was started by black activists who wanted to both support black farmers and provide access to fresh produce in a food desert, a neighborhood that didn't have any access to good food. Okay, so my question is really related to uh, Julian's notion of just sustainability because it's really looking at what is this notion of justice and sustainability? What does it look like when we try and do these two things at the same time? 
So my work investigates two farmers markets in the Bay Area in racially and economically distinct neighborhoods. Methodologically, it consists of 18 months of participant observation, 36 in-depth interviews, surveys of 200 farmers market customers, and focus groups with 69 individuals only in West Oakland who live near the market and don't shop there. And I'll talk to you about why I added those focus groups in a minute. So a lot of ethnographers think a lot about what is our relationship to the folks we study. Right? What do we owe them? What can we produce based on this engagement with them? What's fair, what's ethical, those kinds of questions. Um, and the kind of, I would say, what I, the relationship I had with folks particularly in West Oakland was very, it wasn't as difficult as it might have, as I anticipated it would have been, but it was certainly very complex. And I wanna say that I see this project as a kind of community-based research, even though the questions, that it mo the questions that it's designed to answer weren't necessarily produced by community members themselves. But what I would say I did was I spoke with vendors and managers at the West Oakland Farmers Markets constantly about how my research could help their work. It's worth noting that my surveys were originally intended to ask a question raised by one of the market farmers and that my focus groups were designed in order to fill a requirement uh, for a grant that I received collaboratively with one of the market managers. But the bigger theoretical and intellectual questions that are the major framework for the book, those come out of the academic literature and not out of what community members were looking for. Okay, right. so let me tell you a little bit more about these cases. So my first case is in North Berkeley. Uh, it's managed by the Ecology Center. It's one of the oldest environmental organizations uh, in the country. Uh, it's known for impeccable uh, environmental standards, beautiful, high quality produce, and high prices. All of the produce is organic. Everything, uh, almost everything comes from within 150 miles of the farmer's markets. And this, as you can imagine, according to market supporters, is considered environmentally sustainable because chemical pesticides and fertilizers would otherwise pollute soil, water, and cause a variety of diseases in humans. Local food, of course, is tied to the fewer, using fewer fuel miles, using less fossil fuels. Um, moreover, the farmer's market is a zero waste event. Uh, there's recycling and compost, the market's banned plastic bags and charges you 25 cents for a compostable one if you fail to bring your own. They're really striving to be kind of the greenest farmer's market around. And they do a really good job of it. Uh, it takes place in an affluent, predominantly white neighborhood known colloquially as the Gourmet Ghetto. The neighborhood is filled with exclusive shops and gourmet restaurants. If any of you have heard of Chez Pani in California, it's a very famous restaurant that uses organic food. It's down the street. Um, and their chefs shop at this market and from market farms. Um, Alice Waters, who's the chef and proprietor of Chez Pani, has been a speaker at farmer's market special events, though I suspect she doesn't come regularly because people in Berkeley tend to mob her when she leaves her house. I wish I were kidding. Okay. The affluent environmentalism at the North Berkeley Farmers Market in, uh, in many ways parallels the environmental movement. In North Berkeley, managers, vendors, and customers borrow from environmental narratives, emphasizing connection to wild, beautiful places to create an ethic that ties the production and consumption of organic food to the protection of fertile soil, clean air, and water. Farmers and customers often construct organic farms as scenic landscapes that urban dwellers might be lucky enough to visit. Some display photos along with their produce in order to entice customers with the beauty of their farms. Uh, one farmer even discussed plans to open a bed and breakfast in order to supplement her family's income through agrotourism. And farmer organic food and farmers markets are kind of packaged as these lovely, relaxing, languidly beautiful places that you could go, you would want to go on vacation to. So uh, when I asked just about everyone, uh, just about anyone at the farmer's market why it was important to them, a desire to quote unquote know where their food comes from uh, was nearly always the first response and I suspect this might be something some of you have thought about in terms of why you would purchase local or organic food. This refers to both a sense of connection to the land and an, 
a desire to ensure safe production, and a desire to create a sense of community with the folks who live in the region. So one shopper, a white woman in her 20s who was a chef at Chez Panis, elaborated on this. And I should mention the photo in the background here is one of the photos displayed by one of the farms at the market. So she says, I've even gone to Laura's farm to plan a supper club, one of the farmers. I took notes in the produce and planned the menu around it. It was mind boggling to go out and see where my food is grown. It's amazing to have a sense of where the food comes from because I can feel the energy of that space in the food. Right? And this is the kind of farmer and the kind of chef that you could imagine being written about in one of Michael Pollan's books. Right? And the market kind of has that feel. I should mention he lives locally too. At the North Berkeley Farmers Market, buying organic food becomes a way to connect to and preserve the beautiful, fertile farms in which it's grown, while connecting one's own physical sustenance to the health of the land. As one market manager put it succinctly, dealing with foods is one of the best ways we have to go about saving the planet. Now the affluence of the North Berkeley Market is seemingly at odds with its dedication to social justice. And yet, Market managers and some vendors and customers often spoke of the problem of access to organic food, and they were genuinely concerned about this. Two of the four market managers employed during the time of my study also volunteered with organizations working to increase access to local organic produce in communities of color. One even took to writing a weekly food justice fun fact on a chalkboard in front of the Ecology Center information table as a way to try and bring that work into the farmer's market. Support for social sustainability at the North Berkeley Farmer's Market is not only individual, but institutional. The most prominent example of this is the Farmer's Market's so-called sister program. It's called Farm Fresh Choice and it hires black and Latino youth from low income areas of Berkeley to purchase produce at bulk discounted rates from market farmers and then resell it at farm stands in their own neighborhoods. The Farm Fresh Choice, which doesn't turn a profit, is financially supported with funds from the other ecology center programs like the farmer's market, which is quite lucrative. While regard for the environmental benefits of farmers markets are widely shared by vendors and customers, Regard for issues of social and environmental justice are more mixed. For example, when challenged concerning the high cost of organic food, the featured speaker at a farmer's market special event responded as follows. She said, just because some people can't afford thing, something doesn't mean that those who can shouldn't have it. I don't think we need to degrade everything so that they can afford it. So this statement clearly places the environmental goals of local and organic food over the social justice goals of access and basically says, if you can't afford it, too bad. Moreover, it kind of it reifies the high cost of local organic food while implicitly blaming environmental degradation on low income people's need for low cost food, right? That the land is getting degraded because some people can't afford organic. So similarly, one market vendor's reaction to my own inability to, to afford his food reveals a belief that reduces food access to just desire for sustainable food. He said, people don't like to pay, but at Safeway, you pay later. You pay with your health, you pay with the kind of culture you create. While he claimed not to blame low-income consumers of agribusiness products, his response expressed no sympathy for them. Instead of talking about wages and other constraints, he said, we need to rethink the percentage of our budget that we spend on food. Only when people are willing to pay for it will our relationship with the land become more sustainable. Right, so again, we have this idea that it's not that people don't have enough money, it's that they just don't value this enough. So here, social justice in the form of access is actually posed as a threat to environmental sustainability in the form of ecologically produced food. <coughs> Clearly, the North Berkeley market is an example of what Julian Adjaman calls just sustainability in that it attempts to advocate for both environmentally sustainable food systems to increase social sustainability through food access among low-income people of color. 
but it does not do these things equally. Environmental concerns are clearly prioritized, while issues of social justice are secondary. Indeed, many, farmer, or many customers and farmers patronize this farmer's market without really knowing that the social justice mission of the Ecology Center exists. This reflects the predominantly white and affluent character of the, of the farmer's market. So in my other case, the reverse is true. This is the West Oakland Farmer's Market. It is located in a predominantly low-income African-American neighborhood. The only full-scale grocery store serving its 30,000 residents closed in 2006, making it the very essence of a food desert. The West Oakland Farmer's Market works to bring the neighborhood's food insecure residents together with black farmers whose numbers have declined severely since the 20th century, due in part to discrimination from the USDA. <clears throat> Throughout the 20th century, black farmers were consistently turned down for the kind of assistance that white farmers regularly received. So the goal of this farmer's market is to increase access to the environmental benefit of healthy food in West Oakland while creating green economic opportunities for African Americans in organic agriculture, both the farmers themselves and then uh, local folks who they thought would develop home-based businesses like canning or um, making soap or different kind of value-added products. So as can be gleaned from the above description, this farmer's market explicitly seeks to highlight issues of racial inequality. Um, market founder David Roach puts it the following way. Who grows the food? Who owns the land? Who determines the fate of both? Where does that food go? And who gets it? These simple questions have the same answer, not us. In addition, activists refer to the lack of grocery stores in neighborhoods like theirs as supermarket redlining. Anybody heard of redlining? You guys. So redlining was the process through which banks uh, refused to lend money to black neighborhoods. They refused to, it's bigger than that, but that's part of what happened. And so activists doing this food justice work refer to the process through which supermarkets left the inner city as a kind of parallel form of redlining. In this way, West Oakland Farmers Market participants advance an understanding of the environment that's deeply intertwined with issues of racial inequality. This approach, like other EJ efforts, connects environmental issues to the lived experiences of low-income people and people of color. And the Farmers Market encourages its customers to respond to racism through the purchase of green products from black farmers and small, black, and small business people. It's not sur surprising, then, that black identity is the market's central theme. It's casually referred to as a black farmer's market, though, in the words of one vendor, we're putting it on for us, but everyone is welcome. And as an aside, I don't want to create the false impression that race only matters in communities of color, right? I'm talking explicitly about race in the black market, but I didn't in the white market. And within the larger project, I also talk about how whiteness kind of matters in the North Berkeley Farmers Market and how it characterizes it. Here though, I'm thinking about performances of blackness as a way to connect to how the market is doing environmental justice. And so for me, the, the comparison here is environmental justice versus environmentalism in North Berkeley, right? Whereas in the kind of larger project, I talk much more holistically about race. At the West Oakland Market, vendors often specialize in items that reflect African-American cuisine. When they're available, the Scott Family Farm, that's Mr. Scott in the picture, uh, hangs a large sign that exclaims, we have black-eyed peas. Don't see that in Berkeley. Leroy Musgraves, the farmer who's on the cover of the book, regularly features a wide variety of greens, some of which most white eaters are familiar with, like kale and collards, but also turnip greens and mustard greens and all, all kinds of greens. Lamb's quarters. During the farmer's market, the hungry DJ posse plays music according to the market founder in order to create an atmosphere that brings out the community. 
Stevie Wonder classics are on regular rotation, and one memorable afternoon, Michael Jackson's thriller prompted one farmer to moonwalk down the double yellow lines running through the center of the market. Awesome. I should say this is a far cry from the like one guy with a banjo playing Bob Dylan covers in Berkeley. <laughs> Conversations overheard at the market evidence not only performances of racial identity, but discussions of individual and institutional racism. Um, they were clearest, uh, Hurricane Katrina happened during the time that I was doing my field work. Um, and the conversations the week after that in the market were really striking. Not only because African, African Americans living in Oakland were relatively likely to have a family member or a friend that was living in New Orleans itself, in the black neighborhoods in New Orleans, but also just because of the way they perceived the unfairness of the situation overall. So Leroy, one of the market farmers, derided the media's treatment of whites as victims and blacks as criminals, and I know this got said a million times afterwards, but I, Leroy didn't have a TV or a radio. He wasn't just hearing this. He said, look at Sally, she's getting food for her family. Isn't she industrious and hardworking? Now look at Leroy, he's looting, let's shoot him. The comment not only decries the injustice of the situation, but by using his own name, Leroy demonstrates his identification with its victims. Alexandra West, another black vendor who would, go, who would eventually go to New Orleans and do um, reconstruction work drew similar parallels between that black community and her own. She said, if it happened here, people in West Oakland would be left just the way people in New Orleans were. And there were whole discussions about some of the environmental toxins that were in West Oakland that would come out in the same way that the stuff in, in, um, in Petroleum Alley did in New Orleans. So in some, the West Oakland market uh, atmosphere invokes black identity through food, through, mu through music, through casual conversation. It's largely celebratory, but occasionally discussions of racism are, re are people don't shy away from them. So this approach in which environmental issues are interpreted through the lens of racial and economic inequality is really consistent with a lot of what you see in environmental justice struggles. And additionally, the creation of a local food system has the same environmental benefits in West Oakland as it does elsewhere, of course. Chemical-free food still doesn't require fossil fuel-based pesticides and fertilizers, and local food requires less fuel for transport. But West Oakland managers and vendors don't talk about the environmental benefits of their food in the same way that Berkeley ones do. They rather stress their aspirations for racial equality and community uplift. Right, the need to have some kind of business happening in West Oakland, a place that's been really underdeveloped. The West Oakland market does not emphasize sustainable practices to the same degree as its North Berkeley counterpart. All of the produce is organic, though much of it is uncertified because of the expense of certification. There's no recycling, and some of the prepared food is distributed in foam and plastic packaging. Cooked food sold by local entrepreneurs rarely contains organic or local ingredients. You can find people barbecuing hot links at the farmer's market. Moreover, conversations tend to center on issues of race and racism, where in Berkeley you have people talking about environmental issues all the time. Okay, so things seem pretty all right so far, right? We've got two farmer's markets in two different communities that do a really good job of responding to the desires of the farmers and customers that they're really looking to, to, to bring in. But I want to argue a little bit more critically that there's a real problem with both of these farmers markets as ways to do environmental sustainability, as ways to do social justice. And the problem is that they're really a part of this larger notion of the green economy. So in the green economy, the buying and selling of products are linked to sustain environmental sustainability and sometimes social justice, right? When you buy something because of the ethics behind it, that's part of the green economy. 
So beyond food, you know, organic food you can think of in this way, but also things like solar panels and low flow toilets, Priuses, you know, that, that whole kind of world of green products. So the idea is that if we all just buy these particular products instead of their competitor products, that that will somehow address environmental and social problems. And that's really used as a marketing strategy by the more industrial side of the green economy. And a lot of people recognize that the green economy is a problem when you have Walmart doing it, but they're less critical of it when it's kind of the farmer down the road. And I want to argue that the problem's not necessarily with the farmer down the road, so much as the whole idea that just buying his produce is going to do the kinds of environmental and social justice work that we really want it to do. So the green economic context requires that farmers markets define environmentalism and justice as commodities. So a commodity is any good produced by human labor and offered for sale in the market, right? Something you can pay for and buy and take home. In capitalist societies, food is a commodity. But those buying local and organic food are paying not only for the food itself, but for the perceived environmental and social justice benefits. So they're kind of like these hybrid commodities, right? There's the thing, but there's also the idea behind the thing that's part of what you're paying for. So when a North Berkeley customer buys a strawberry, they're paying in part for the cultivation of healthy soil and the livelihood of small farmers. So these environmental goods become part of the commodity that they're buying, their sustainable strawberry. And when a West Oakland shopper buys a peach, they're paying to support African American farmers and to provide fresh food in West Oakland. And so their social justice goals become part of what they're paying for in their anti-racist peach. In this way, each farmer's market's environmental, justice, uh, environmental and social justice goals become things to be bought and sold in the context of the green economy. The way this happens is through what I call the logic of support. So how do these kind of hybrids between ideas and commodities get formed? The logic of support allows consumer purchases to be perceived as a way to do something to further the goal being, being put out, right? So when you, so here, for example, in a letter to its members, the Ecology Center's executive director emphasized the positive consequences of economic support for the Berkeley farmers markets. He said, by shopping at the Berkeley farmers markets, you're safeguarding a way of life while feeding yourself, protecting family farms and rich topsoil. I mean, you can even just think about those white support organic farmer bumper stickers that you see on trucks. Okay, in encouraging customers to make the purchases in the interest of farmland and livelihood, this market treats environmentalism and justice as commodities. Similarly, in an email to his mailing list, the West Oakland market founder just describe the need to purchase food grown by black farmers, and he did so using similar language. He said, in our efforts to redevelop a connection between black farmers and residents of the west side of Oakland, we ask that you shop weekly at the farmer's market. So again, this idea of support is central. Purchasing from market farmers is a way to both ensure the economic survival of African American farmers and to increase the food access of West Oakland residents. Market customers are buying environmentalism and justice in the form of vegetables. Okay. So treating environmental justice and environmentalism as commodities has its downsides. So first, there's a wealth of work in economic sociology that talks about the limits of markets in addressing social problems. And social and sociologists and cultural geographers offer broad yet parallel critiques of neoliberalism. One of the key tenets of neoliberalism is that social problems like environmental issues and inequality should be addressed, if at all, through the market rather than the state, right? The key idea of neoliberalism is that there shouldn't be any state restrictions of what the market can do. And if there's some issue that needs to be addressed, it should be addressed by consumption through the market. You should have a business that creates a product 
that will address the problem and that we can all advocate for it by buying that product. In fact, it's the very logic of the green economy. Moreover, the green economy prices environmentalism and social justice really differently. Demand for the former is higher in affluent, predominantly white communities like Berkeley, whose residents are both willing and able to pay premium prices for it. Indeed, because environmentalism is part of the commodity the North Berkeley farmers market is selling, its environmental credentials contribute to its uh, profitability, right? People are willing to pay a little extra for organic food, local food, food produced by local farmers. Justice, however, does not carry the same premium price, right? Even in progressive cities like Berkeley, few customers are willing to pay extra to support African-American farmers or to ensure food access in West Oakland. And in a larger example, efforts to create a kind of domestic fair trade certification for farms that, that have good pay and working conditions for their farm workers. These efforts have been in the process for years and years and it never seems to really get off the ground because the, the extra value that a farmer could get for advertising their product in this way is perceived to be not very large. So few customers in Berkeley are willing to pay for issues of social and racial justice, the issues that are most important to the folks in West Oakland. Middle class African Americans, however, do travel from wealthier neighborhoods to support the West Oakland farmers market. Right? You can imagine that affluent black people would be more likely to pay extra for that premium. However, there's not enough of them, they don't try to do this regularly enough or in high enough numbers to sustain the farmers market. Right? The thousands of customers you see in North Berkeley are not matched in Oakland. And while prices in West Oakland are lower than in other Bay Area farmers markets, West Oakland residents generally leave the neighborhood to procure the cheapest possible food at discount supermarkets. Right? People who are really poor aren't looking for just, oh, this kale's cheaper than kale elsewhere. They're looking for the cheapest possible ways to feed themselves. This illuminates one of the difficulties of using the green economy to create environmental justice in marginalized communities. Low income residents often do not have the economic means to support green producers. And because the West Oakland farmers market draws few customers, it doesn't really fulfill its promise of creating economic opportunities for local, for local entrepreneurs or increased revenues for African American farmers. Both groups continue to sustain the farmer's market for years out of a desire to support the cause, but the, but the part of the cause that was about supporting them was never realized. So for this reason, there's eventually high turnover among vendors, and those who remained until the market closed in 2008 tended to have other sources of income and to see their participation as a form of community activism. Farmers effectively subsidized the market in order to serve its few consistent customers and in the hopes that local demand would eventually grow. In North Berkeley, dedication to justice exists largely outside of market exchange relations. Uh, Farm Fresh Choice is funded through foundation grants and with money raised from other ecology center pro programs and couldn't exist if it had to pay its own way. So the green economy is inherently undemocratic. Influence depends on an actor's ability to spend money on green products. In other words, if we're voting with our dollars, then those of us with less dollars get less votes. So green economic venues are more economically successful when they prioritize the issues and products that best appeal to affluent consumers. Low-income con consumers can't by themselves support green economies by definition, and moreover, affluent consumers might be less willing to pay premiums to advance the issues of justice that are most resonant and most important in marginalized communities. Okay. So summing up a little bit. Uh, what does this tell us about environmentalism and social justice in the context of the green economy? So first, it tells us that you can do environmentalism and social justice at the same time. It's not easy, it's not even, and it requires active work of folks on the ground to really think about how to put these goals together. 
right? So the sustainable food movement is often accused of ignoring issues of inequality and social justice. And that may be true for individual products or individual projects, right? But it doesn't have to be the case. It's possible to do it differently. Right? But these issue, these goals need don't have to be enacted equally, right? This Julian's notion of just sustainability tends to theorize this kind of midpoint of a continuum, right? Where it's equally about justice and sustainability. And what I found on the ground is that social location really affects where on that continuum you end up. So to connect back to the framework that I laid out at the beginning of this talk, it's clear that this research project lies at the heart of how food justice has thus far been defined. So I look to the West Oakland Farmers Market to explore how various racial projects have created disproportionate access to the environmental benefit of healthy food, and how actors on the ground reinvent cultural foodways in order to address this inequality. My project compares this case to a whiter and more affluent farmers market in order to better understand how, if left uninterrogated, racial privilege can come to characterize sustainable agriculture projects, and how that privilege can be, uh, can be challenged in order to create alliances across race and class. So the field of food justice as an intellectual project is really a nascent one. And I don't mean that people haven't been looking at the intersections between food and inequalities for generations, but the kind of crystallizing around this idea of food justice is a relatively new development. Um, and it's really exciting to be thinking about where it's going from here. Um, one thing that I think is really under theorized in cultivating food justice and that I really am excited to see go a little further is uh, work on food justice and gender. And I know there's lots of work on food and gender that predates it, but within the context of this particular conversation on food justice, it's kind of got a little push to the side. Um, so uh, Patricia Allen and Ryan Pildren are two women uh, scholars who have been examining how gender and sexuality play out in the sustainable agriculture movement and how the movement could better incorporate social justice through feminist and queer perspectives. Uh, Teresa Merez is working with immigrant farmers to better develop links between food, migration, and labor. Uh, her work aims to understand how migration affects cultural foodways and how pre-migratory food knowledges might serve as a strategy to, co to cope with the difficulties of migration. And Charlotte Biltakoff's no longer forthcoming book came out a couple of days ago. Eating Right in America is a social history of dietary advice that adds a really nuanced context to our discussion about the relationship between class politics and notions of appropriate eating. Uh, Allison and Jessica Hayes Conroy's Doing Nutrition Differently is an edited volume that attempts to open up the discussion of what nutrition is and what nutrition is for. And this kind of critical nutrition studies is, is a really interesting vein of scholars talking about how do we decide what food is healthy and what are the kind of race and class politics that are implicated in those decisions. Not just the science of what nutrients we need, but what's the kind of cultural context in which these discussions happen. So I wanna end by describing what I'm doing now. Uh, so I'm working with Brian Galt, who's at UC Davis, uh, and some of his students to create a national survey of food justice organizations. We're, I'm super excited about this uh, because almost all of the work on food justice has been done at the kind of local or maybe regional level. Um, and this national survey is kind of a way to think comparatively about what different organizations are doing, what they value, what the different issues that they're working on are. Um, I don't have any results to tell you about because we're only in the data analysis phase. Uh, but what we did was talk with about 20 food justice activists to try and develop what the questions they thought were most important were. And so they did this long kind of open-ended survey for us. And we analyzed that and we used that to develop the next survey, which was like kind of multiple choice, could go out on survey monkey kind of thing. And we had a couple of hundred responses. Um, and now we're looking at what they say. 
Okay, so I'm also working uh, with Josh Kaji, who's one of my grad students, on a second project on food justice and uh, gentrification. So the thinking is, is that in some ways these food justice projects, there's two ways that this happens. So Josh is one of the founders of uh, Fat Beats Produce, which is a food justice organization in North Oakland, which is the neighborhood I actually lived in when I was doing this research. Um, and two things happen. So one is that food justice projects make the neighborhood look more attractive to young, predominantly white, kind of hip folks who are really interested in farmers markets and food justice who end up showing up in the neighborhood even more. And what happened at Fat Beats was that eventually they actually lost their lease on the cafe that they had started with a bunch of long-term North Oakland residents. These are the folks from the cafe in the big picture. Um, and they actually lost their lease to a young white woman and her restaurant business. Um, and there was some possibility that they were gonna share it and work it out, but she decided she's uh, celiac, she has celiac disease, and said that nobody could have any gluten anywhere in the restaurant. And the you know, immigrant and long-standing community members who had very traditional food ways basically said, we can't make our food without gluten. And now Fat Beats doesn't have a cafe. So some of it is that the food justice organizations themselves get gentrified out, but some of it is also that they play a role in making the neighborhood seem more palatable to the folks who's moving in can push other people out. Right? So we're kind of thinking through these dynamics of what is the relationship between food justice and gentrification and how food justice organizers can be really wary of these dynamics. So lastly, I'm starting a new book. This is the first time I've talked about this. So lastly, I'm starting a new book that in some ways uh, picks up where black, white, and green leaves off. It's called, for now, Food Justice and the Challenge of Neoliberalism, and it looks at three strategies through which food justice organizations are responding creatively to the challenge of the green economy. The idea is, what are food justice organizations doing that aren't just trying to get people to buy their way to a more just and sustainable food system? So one strategy that I'm gonna look into is the creation of worker-owned cooperatives. And while this still kind of has a kind of shop here as a way to do change um, approach, I think it's really interesting because worker cooperatives aren't straightforwardly capitalist businesses, right? They have, you know, there's no non-worker owners of the means of production. There's participatory democracy in terms of who has decision-making power over the business, you know, everyone who works for the business is running it cooperatively. Um, a second strategy is support for workers' rights throughout the food system. And I think that this will create not only stronger alliances with working class communities and communities of color, but it'll also help to improve food systems beyond the provision of alternatives, right? So things will get better if these initiatives are successful. Things will get better for workers throughout the food system regardless of whether they decide to shop and eat differently. Last, I'll be looking at collective policy campaigns that attempt to restrict bad practices in the food systems. Like the workers' right cam rights campaigns, these will garner environmental benefits that individuals do not have to opt into through individual consumption. And here I'll be spotlighting the California campaign against methyl iodide as well as GMO organizing. So in sum, thank you guys so much for having me here to talk about my work. It's been really wonderful to be on campus today. Um, this is a really exciting time to think about the relationship between food, social justice, and environmental sustainability, in part because the, the, number, the sheer number of students who are really excited about thinking about this. And so it, it gives me a lot of hope to think that things in the food system, as entrenched as the industrial paradigm is, it gives me a lot of hope to go and get to speak to different groups of students and see how engaged folks are on these issues and how knowledgeable students are on these issues. Um, and it, it really makes me think that things can change. And so my goal in coming to talk to you guys is to get you to think critically about what those changes you wanna make are. Thanks so much.
conversation now. People who are only here for extra credit, leave now. <laughs> Hi, uh, yeah, thank you for your presentation. I look forward to using the book in my seminar. I this. Thank you. Uh, I, I do have a question, though. I'm wondering about you. Uh, in terms of the, the, the kind of the critique of both markets, using the critique of neoliberalism, kind of the, the commodification, um, the, the commodification of both, um, uh, I guess, yeah, food and also, but also justice, but it's actually way of framing it. But I mean, there's something, it's not just, they're not just being commodified, they're also inviting people, it seems to me when they're saying come support our community, it's not just financially, but come and talk to us, get beyond, um, uh, you know, your alienation from food and get to know us as a community. It's, it doesn't sound like the neoliberal market, it's, it's also kind of the face-to-face -face interaction that they're encouraging. It's almost a little harsh to say it's, it's, it's a neoliberal market that's going yeah, thank you for that question. And it feels a little harsh, right? Because these are places I've spent a lot of time and really enjoy and have close connections with. Should I use that? Sure. Okay. Sure, no problem. Um, but at the same time, I think what I'm less critical of are the markets themselves, right? Farmers markets exist as markets, as places to go shopping. We all need to eat. We still live in a world where food is something we need to buy for the most part. Why not there? These are these are better places than most, right? What I'm super critical of is the notion that shop shopping at the farmer's market is an environmental or a social justice act. And that just voting with, it's the, the idea, the very idea of voting with your dollar, right? It's shopping, it's not voting, right? And even though you can, you might say, oh, but we can, you know, that'll create more markets. Well, yes, it'll create more markets. But if we think about how much and how rapidly, for example, farmers markets and organic food have grown in the last couple of decades, right? It's been astronomical. And they've become 1% of food dollars, right? Because while all these alternative projects are growing and while we're all kind of getting all excited about them, the industrial food system is growing too. And I think that folks who are really interested in sustainable agriculture, in socially just agriculture, really need to think beyond the way we eat and the way our communities eat, and even beyond questions of access, and really think about what do we need to do to change the whole landscape in which food is produced, right? What do we need to do to think about social justice and sustainability on that kind of scale? And I think what we need to do is get more political, right? We need to use these farmers markets as places to build power and I'm not sure they're really doing that because I think at this, well, on the one hand, there's so much education around why sustainable food is important, even why food justice is important, like, right, less so, but still quite a bit. Um, there's simultaneously the notion that we don't need to work, there's simultaneously a kind of political education happening that says we don't need to work through the state, we don't need to change laws and practices, we just need to vote with our forks or our dollars and that that will somehow do it. And so that's where my critique of neoliberalism come in, comes in. But thank you. Um, I just wanted to thank you first and foremost for your comments. Um, I will be super interested to read your book. You're one um, I'm actually a food activist myself, and um, I'm really glad that there are people that are promoting this idea of building power. And one of the things I actually wanted to bring up was locally that people may have heard about, uh, but Sodexo, who is this large multinational uh, food service corporation, it's the second largest one in the world, um, they make like $12 billion a year in profits, um, they are the ones that do food and dining services here at the university, and 
Yes, that's great. You should all do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, I mean, that's precisely the kind of thinking beyond just individual consumption that I'm talking about. And if you're really, I, for me, it starts with the kind of food justice component. It starts with thinking about how sustainable agriculture uh, is meaningful to low income and communities of color just because of like my own trajectory and the kind of order in which things occurred to me um, where I was exposed to things. And so for me, it started with thinking about issues of food access. And it was when I realized just how far from being able to address these issues of access that the kind of Berkeley style sustainable agriculture movement was that I started to realize that these, these campaigns were really where it was at. Um, and so working with workers, um, I think is really one of the ways to think much more broadly about what sustainable food systems can and should look like, right? Because if we're really in this to transform industrial food production, not just create yummy fun alternatives, I'm all about them, but they're not enough, right? But to really transform this thing, then we need to hit it wherever it's vulnerable. And if it's vulnerable on environmental grounds, then we need to go after it on environmental grounds. And if it's vulnerable in terms of its dependence on super exploited labor who have more, who have power in terms of being able to get their needs met within the, you know, in terms of their ability to get their needs met within this industrial system is one of its big vulnerabilities, right? And so working with groups like that doesn't just have the benefit of working across race and across class, which I think is a good thing ethically by itself, but also is yet another way to target this big industrial agriculture system that, you know, I, I always assume everyone I talk to wants to bring down. <laughs> you can, <laughs> that, I might be wrong. Yeah. Do you want to think? I'll scream. Okay. Thank you. Great question. Um, yeah, so I actually think about, my undergrad was in poli sci and like polit politics of development was what I wrote my, thesis, my like undergrad thesis on. So I think about that stuff all the time. Um, and I, the import substitution analogy though, I had never, I've never thought about that. It's perfect. It's really, really good. Um, but I think and it's one of the ways that I'm in this kind of critical conversation with folks in the food justice movement because I think the activists on the ground, they wanna say, we're gonna do the development work in our own communities and we're gonna glean the economic benefits from it. I mean, you know, We're gonna start our own small businesses providing food to the black community in West Oakland or Milwaukee or you know, South Side of Chicago, fill in the city, right? And we wanna, we don't want we don't want predominantly white organizations coming in and capitalizing off of it. There's real turf wars that happen. And I want to think with them about how to, you know, like it can't, that almost sounds a little bootstrappy to me, right? It sounds like they can take care of their own needs without much help or assistance. And that would be true if we didn't live in a wholly unequal world where things like underdevelopment and redlining, right, are, underdevelopment is still happening, redlining is still having, you know, dramatic effects. And if you think about the foreclosure crisis, you could argue redlining is still happening um, in a very different way, right? And so I wanna think with them, I wanna push with them to think more critically about what is the landscape in which they could do that, right? Because I think too many of these programs don't turn a profit and then when people think about why, they think about it in terms of the individuals involved. And I don't actually think it's a problem of these individuals. You know, they're individual dynamics, but they're individual dynamics everywhere, 
right? It's a problem systematically because the landscape in which they're trying to develop this local green economy in places like West Oakland still makes it such a difficult thing to do, right? The poverty of the folks who live around it, the smaller numbers of farmers, the you know, smaller number, the, the lesser amount of publicity for folks who want to do this kinds of work. And really that you only get the really, the big publicity and the big funding if you don't talk structurally, right? If you take a million dollars from Walmart, for example. Right, and so, yeah, I think there's a real, there's a real problem with just this kind of, oh, we can do it ourselves mentality. Thank you very much for the talk. It was great. I have two questions. Um, one is on the sort of, um, if it were like, if you had the ability to pass legislation, could you think of, you know, let's say two pieces of legislation that really could um, have an impact on the industrialized food system and people have access to it? What would they be? And the second question is in terms of the ground up issue. There's been a lot of publicity um, about Detroit, which we like. Can you hear me? I can, but the camera oh, might prefer the mic. Should I repeat it? Okay, so I have two questions for our speaker. Um, first, um, if she had the power actually to enact some legislation that would um, drastically change the industrialized food system and people's access to it, what would that be? And secondly, in terms of the other side of you know, ground up issue, um, there's been a lot of publicity about various um, initiatives in Detroit, which we think of as a, you know, on the one hand we hear the city's bankrupt, and then we hear about, oh, there are all these gardens, and things like that. <laughs> so I, I would be very curious about your evaluation of that. Well, you know, what would you do if you could do the systematic thing, legislatively, and also what about, um, I'd be curious about that kind of effort. Detroit, and I know about Yeah, um, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind with the magic wand question is uh, farm subsidies, right? What if instead of subsidizing high fructose corn syrup and all the different ways that farmers get subsidies now, instead the subsidies went to organic production, local distribution, and particularly to selling in communities with lesser access to food? Um, to some degree, Brazil has done this, not entirely, but where farmers, at least in the last part, where farmers who sell in the poorest neighborhoods, um, it's kind of a, it's kind of a complicated system. But in this one city called Curitiba, the um, if they sell in the poorest neighborhoods, they also get access to really great spots in, in very wealthy neighborhoods, and so it's kind of offset. Um, so that, I mean, subsidies are kind of the first thing I think about, right? What if you, you know, not using pesticides got you a subsidy and then organic food was cheaper than conventional food, right? I know it's not that simple, by the way. I mean, also in turn, you know, there are lots of laws on the books in terms of treatment of farm workers. Very few of them are enforced, um, but some kind of comprehensive labor and immigration policy that made it possible to earn a good living working on farms, both as an owner and as a worker, right? Because I think, and I tend to do this, you know, this kind of like, let's play the farmers against the workers thing. It doesn't work, very, work out very well for the workers. It doesn't even work out very well for the farmers, to be perfectly honest, right? But there, should, there needs to be some way that farming, all of the aspects of farming, um, are good livelihoods, you know? And I think, I mean, God, there's so many things I could do with a magic wand. Um, the Detroit question is a great one. I got to go to Michigan two years ago um, and hang out at D-Town Farms and a couple of the other places. And there really is a very strong community food movement, right? Folks growing gardens and they're a very politically engaged group, at least at the local level. Um, they're really, you know, the city of Detroit is a difficult city to work with, um, and that's an understatement, but to the degree that it's possible, they're really not just growing gardens. They're also engaging with the city to think about development and zoning and how the future of Detroit, uh, had the reemergence of Detroit can happen in a way 
where the uh, resources of the city aren't just given to the guy from Quicken Loans, um, but where they're really, you know, where folks who have been in that city for generations get to have a stake in how it develops. Um, and so I think what's most helpful about Detroit, there's many things that are really helpful about Detroit. It's actually a really positive place to be. Um, but what's most hopeful isn't just how engaged people are around food and farming, but how politicized they are around food and farming. And I think that as Detroit get, as Detroiters get control of the city politically back, which I really hope happens soon, um, the food constituency will be, will play a major role in what happens in the city. Um, you spoke mostly about uh, economic disparity and incredibly important uh, factors impacting uh, food access and things like that. Um, but I've kind of found, not found that apathy or kind of ignorance of food related or justice related uh, aspects of our food system are the biggest problems, but do you see uh, people like uh, Guerrilla uh, gorilla Gardeners or Ron Allen in uh, Los Angeles uh, kind of creating food as a counter uh, food as a counterculture, or um, uh, entities like Food Not Bombs as really positive allies or potentially undermining market sources? Or yeah, no, that's a great question, and I think anybody doing food work in a way that gets us to question. I mean, really anybody doing anything in a way that gets us to question the kind of primacy of the market is good, um, you know, is helpful. But I do think this notion of like, let's just be out, let's just ignore the market, right? Let's be outside the market and pretend it doesn't exist is not the same as working to confront it. Um, and I think, you know, all of these things are good, but that some needs to still be confrontation. And in my opinion, you know, um, and so a, a lot of, you know, like there was a lot of, in Oakland, there was a lot of Occupy the Food System stuff that happened in the context of the Oakland Occupy, which was really amazing to see. And at the same time, their idea of how to occupy the food system was to like grow your own garden. And that didn't strike me as much of an occupation, right? It didn't strike me as nearly confrontational enough. Um, and it, it seemed to me that, you know, Ron Finley's gardens are amazing, right? But they don't really do anything for food workers or farm workers or folks who live in places where they get sprayed with pesticides. And part of my like part of my privilege as an academic really is that like I'm not trying to do a project on the ground, right? I'm really trying to think holistically about what these projects can build to. Um, and so while I would never tell him what he's, he's doing it wrong, right? I think at the same time, talking about what that contributes and what it doesn't contribute or what myths it might sell, right? This notion that, you know, we can just kind of uh, plant our own seeds and that like just growing your own food is a form of revolution, right? It, it's not. Growing your own food is a way to eat really well. And it can even be a way to cope with food insecurity if you're experiencing with it, but it's not a revolution. Right? And if we're really going to, again, if we're really going to transform this industrial food system, then we need to confront it. We can't just kind of hide from it. All right, so kind of a good place to end. <laughs> um, so let's give another round of applause. For you know consumption more than necessary, you don't have to buy the book to ask your questions, <laughs> but definitely we'll sort of move into more of an individualized um, you know chat and um, feel free to hang around. It seems like there's some really great people in the audience here, so thank you again for coming.